Good afternoon, everyone. Are we ready to start? Commissioner, so we're ready on our end. So whenever you are. Okay. Let me just check. 
I'd like to call to order the January 26, 2021 meeting for the City Planning Commission to order at 1.34. Um, before we get started, I'd like to do a roll call to make sure to record all commissioners present. Um, commissioners, please respond when your name is called. Uh, Commissioner Brown? I'm present, thank you. Commissioner Flick? Commissioner Lund? Here. Commissioner Marshall? Here. Commissioner Mo Mobley? Present. Commissioner Stieg? Here. Commissioner Stewart's president, Commissioner Weberg? Present. Commissioner Wittry? Okay. Wittry's present, thank you. And I know Commissioner Flick was with us earlier. Commissioner Flick, um, are you on? I actually can't see you. Are you with us right now? All right, if not, let the record reflect that we have all commissioners present except for uh, Commissioner Flick at this time. Now I will read the special rules um, into the record. Uh, actually, first we'll have the approval of the minutes um, from our January 12th meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes for our January 12th meeting? Yeah, I'll make that motion. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Steve, go ahead. It's Katie. Oh, sorry, Katie. Um, I I'll make the motion. All right. It's been moved by Commissioner Steve. Is there a second to that motion? Wittry will second the motion. Commissioner Wittry has seconded that motion. Is there any further discussion? Now we have a roll call of the for vote. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Lund? Yes. Commissioner Marshall? Yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. M Commissioner Steed? Yes. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Weber? Yes. Commissioner Wittry? Yes. All right. Unanimous, unanimous support uh, for the motion for approval of the minutes uh, for January 12th. At this time now, I'll read the special public hearing rules into record. Order of business. The order of business at the hearing should be as followed. Call to order and, and roll call with recording of the members present. Approval of the minutes. Reading of the hearing rules. Presentation of docket. Staff presentation. Applicant presentation. Questions from members. A recess for 30 minutes. Consideration of docket. Public comment. Rebuttal by the applicant. Questions from members. Voting adjournment. Presentation of the dockets. The order of the business for each docket shall be as followed. Presentation by the City Planning Commission staff or the Department of Safety and Permit staff. Presentation by the applicant or their representatives. The appellate or the applicant may appear on, the, on their behalf or be represented by a duly authorized agent. Only one representative may speak on behalf of a request and must pre-register with the staff of the City Planning Commission. Other representatives or speakers may sign up to provide comments during the public comment portion of the meeting. The applicant shall be allowed a maximum of three minutes. Questions from members. The members have an opportunity to ask questions of the staff or applicant. Recess. The commission shall take a 30 minute recess to allow members of the public to comment. Public comment. Rules. Only written public comment will be allowed live public comment will not be allowed. No member of the public may submit more than one written comment per agenda item. Time allowed for public comment. The public comment form, form will be made available at the start of the meeting and will close at the end of the 30 minute recess. Public comments must be submitted electronically or on the form provided by the City Planning Commission. Any comment missing this information will not be read aloud. Each submission must contain the commenter's first and last name, the commenter's address, and whether the commenter is being paid in connection with his or her comments. The agenda item. 
reading the public comments. A moderator will read into the record all comments pertaining to that item that have been submitted in accordance with these rules. Comments will be read aloud in a normal speaking voice. The moderator will discontinue reading a comment once it exceeds two minutes. Rebuttal by applicant. Following the public comment period, if there is opposition, the authorized representative of the application is allowed a rebuttal not to exceed three minutes. Question from members. Following the public comment and rebuttal, the members have the opportunity to ask questions of the staff or applicant. Voting, making a motion. The member making a motion should clearly, clearly state their name when making a motion. For example, I, Commissioner Stewart, move to approve, deny the request. Second motion. The member seconding the motion shall clearly state their name when seconding the motion. For example, I, Commissioner Stewart, second the motion made by Commissioner Marshall. Statement by the chair. The chair will re restate the motion confirming who made and second the motion. Voting. The chair, chair will request a verbal vote from each member by roll call. Each member will indicate yay to vote in support of the motion or nay to vote in opposition. At this time now, we'll move to the presentation of dockets. Um, um, next on our agenda is the outdoor live entertainment study. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Today we'll uh, discuss the, or do the presentation again from our December 8th presentation where the City Planning Commission deferred action until today in order to allow for more public comment. The outdoor live entertainment study motion was initiated by council motion by council members Bank, Banks and Gustafson and Palmer were the sponsors. The motion references two recent zoning dockets, one concerning allowing new secondary use of outdoor live entertainment in the MU2 mixed use high intensity district and restricting uh, uh, outdoor dining and outdoor live entertainment in yards abutting a residential district. The motion asked the CPC to consider regulations in San Francisco, Seattle, Austin and, the, and Nashville and asked the CPC to review the city's regulations and interpretations and enforcement mechanisms. <clears throat> the goals developed by the study team were based on the city council motion, which are preserve New Orleans rich musical heritage through appropriate regulations, clarify regulations that define, provide use standards and determine uh, appropriate districts uh, and the com compatible context for outdoor live entertainment, resolve contradictions in the live entertainment secondary use and reception facility uh, use standards and definitions relating to closed door and window policy and distance from residential districts, explore temporary outdoor live entertainment event permitting regulation procedures, reduce any unintended secondary effects of outdoor live entertainment relative to the cultural and residential fabric of the city, and consider how COVID-19 may temporarily or permanently change the way events operate. <clears throat> the zoning regulations that the CPC reviewed uh, include existing, this existing terms, definitions, and standards for uses where outdoor live entertainment is contemplated. These include outdoor amphitheater, outdoor amusement facility, live entertainment secondary use, reception facility, public market, cultural facility, musical accompaniment and temporary, temporary outdoor entertainment. Uh, the CPC staff considered potential changes to the zoning district permissions and the use charts. Use charts were reviewed citywide, including the open space, historic core non-residential, historic urban non-residential, suburban non-residential, commercial centers, industrial and central business districts. In addition, arts and cultural overlays were reviewed since they may affect use permissions where they are. 
potential mitigation measures that were considered are sizes of outdoor facilities, design of outdoor facilities, distances from residential, hours of operation, compliance with the noise or sound ordinance, sound mitigation strategies, and using temporary permits for ease of enforcement. What wasn't covered in the study was cultural activity in the public right of way, such as second lines and street performances, since these are generally uh, not covered by zoning, music played at private residences for personal enjoyment or practice, and though the CPC staff researched issues and needed modifications related to the noise or sound ordinance, we did not attempt any re revisions, which are the purview of the city's health department. It is common uh, in, in any study to do best practices research. And we found in the studies that we examined that, that it is common practice to prescribe decibel limits, hours of operation, sound abatement plans, orientation design of sound equipment, and to clearly delineate enforcement mechanisms and appeal processes. Many jurisdictions also tie sound regulations to the specific characteristics of the zoning district and may require good neighbor policies or notification requirements when certain criteria are met. A New Orleans Music Commission, similar to the Austin Music Commission, would provide an opportunity for music economy stakeholders to contribute to public policies and process. A music disaster relief fund for things like COVID-19, hurricanes, flooding, would help financially support the city's local music economy during times of distress and natural disaster. A live music fund would support local musicians more generally. A music census report would provide policymakers with data related to the local music economy so that appointed and elected officials can make data-driven decisions. And institutionalizing a music office review would formalize transparency, accountability, and expediency in the review of music-related permits and potentially make the review process more predictable for applicants seeking permits. Now, and now our recommendations. <clears throat> the temporary event permits are generally how, tempor how music festivals operate, but they can also apply to businesses or institutional use. Currently, the CZO limits a site to eight permits per year, each of which may include up to three days for a total of 24 days per year. During the COVID state of emergency declared by the mayor, this limit has been suspended so that restaurants and other uses can provide more safe outdoor entertainment rather than indoor. The study team notes that there are a number of number advantages to using temporary permits beyond the state of emergency. These include easier enforcement against bad actors who may violate the terms of the permit, same safety and permits and the law department have noted that adjudication of vested rights is a difficult and time consuming process. Another advantage may be less resistance to the provision of live entertainment if it is known that this is not a vested right. The study team recommends an increase in the number of temporary events that can be held by commercial and institutional uses. To start, this could be a one year pilot program. We recommend making the temporary permitting process easier by allowing a business to obtain one permit covering up to a year's planned outdoor entertainment. Regard to out, outdoor amphitheater. Outdoor amphitheater is an outdoor structure that accommodates an audience for concerts, public speaking, or other live entertainment, which is open to the general public with or without an admission charge. An outdoor amphitheater includes band shell structures. This use is extremely limited in the zoning districts in that it can be and only allowed it in park districts currently. The study team recommends a few other high intensity districts, but also recommends establishing a parking standard for its use in non-park districts as one was not created when the use is considered accessory to a park. An example of uh, a place that may become a, a regular location for outdoor amphitheater is Duncan Plaza across from City Hall a project that will be developed uh, jointly with the downtown development district. An outdoor amusement facility is a participatory and spectator uses conducted outdoors, which may include partially enclosed facilities. Typical uses include, but are not limited to miniature golf courses, batting cages, archery ranges, and outdoor racetracks, theme parks, and amusement parks. An outdoor amusement facility includes ancillary uses such as food stands, snack bars, or restaurants for the use of patrons, but do not serve alcoholic beverages. 
So outdoor amusement facility is also very limited in the zoning districts where it is authorized. The study team recommended authorizing outdoor live entertainment that might serve as ancillary to the main use while the, while the main amusement is still operating. The public market is a recurring assembly of multiple vendors in selling arts, crafts, edible items, packaged food or beverages, produce and other similar merchandise directly to retail customers in a covered or uncovered open air setting. Earlier this year, public markets were given the authority to provide live entertainment during their regular operating hours as part of a text amendment adopted by the city council. This change could provide some interesting opportunities in the future as public markets are authorized in numerous commercial and mixed use zoning districts. Study team recommends some additional use standards from public markets for when outdoor live entertainment is provided. A cultural facility is a use that is open to the public and provides cultural services and facilities, including but not limited to libraries, museums, aquariums, zoos, botanical gardens, and historical societies. A cultural facility may have ancillary retail uses that offers items related to the facility for sale and ancillary restaurants, which are only open during the hours of operation of the facility. A cultural facility may hold special events and receptions on site, including events that take place after closing hours. This is an interesting use because it's authorized in both residential and non-residential districts. The mention of receptions and special events does not automatically convey live entertainment. However, the study team believes that sh that should be permitted in the non-residential districts. Because the definition allows for events after hours, the study team believes that in residential districts, it'd be good to clarify that outdoor events should not go beyond the hours of operation. <clears throat> live entertainment secondary use is uh, any one or more of the following types of live performances performed live by one or more persons, whether or not done for compensation and whether or not admission is charged, musical act, theatrical play or act, including stand-up comedy, magic, dance clubs, and disc jockey performances using vinyl records, compact discs, computers, or digital music players where the disc jockeys and verbal communication with the clientele of the establishment. The definition also specifies the types of live entertainment that do not rise to the level of live entertainment secondary use and are therefore unregulated if done within the boundaries specified. This use, as the name implies, is secondary to a main use, which can only be a standard restaurant, specialty restaurant, indoor amusement facility, bar, or brewery. This is the use that you might remember a good deal of conversation about in 2019 based on an interpretation by safety and permits that the way the standards were written, they essentially prohibit outdoor live entertainment which does not seem to be the intent of the standards. A number of the recommendations are aimed at clarification of those issues while others are to provide more guidance. Arts and cultural overlays are generally allow live entertainment in a more permissive manner than their base zoning regulations. These overlays have always been initiated by the community, so there is some community buy-in for making these locations a destination for live entertainment. The overlays could represent a good starting point for outdoor live entertainment, or they could be areas that allow later hours for more or more frequent outdoor performances. Each overlay could have its own hours. They were created with regulations that already vary. So the arts and cultural overlays include Frenchman Street, St. Bernard Avenue, Broad Street, LaSalle, LaSalle Street in Central City, Newton and Tesh Streets in Algiers, St. Claude Avenue in Bywater, and an area of Treme that includes North Claiborne Avenue and North Rampart Street. A key recommendation of the study is the revision of the noise or sound ordinance. Compliance with the noise or sound ordinance the study team met with representatives of the health and law departments about the, about the ordinance. There are serious issues with the outdated uh, ordinance that make it difficult to enforce. Both departments acknowledge that a revision is needed, which will be the purview of the health department, which is also responsible for its enforcement. This may not happen until the COVID pandemic is more fully under control, freeing up the health department staff and members of the public who would need to be needed to participate in the process of writing a new uh, ordinance. 
study recommends a phased approach to outdoor live entertainment, it may be best to depend on temporary permits until such time as a revised sound ordinance is ready. The recommendations uh, throughout the study may even be seen as all a cart where you pick some of them for implementation now or some of them for later. These planning recommendations are, are strongly supported by the master plan. So what happens after the City Planning Commission forwards the study to the City Council? Uh, the study is provided for informational purposes only. The Council is not under a deadline to review the study. If the Council wishes to act on recommendations of the study relative to the Comprehensive Zoning Ordinance, a text amendment motion is required. Text amendment motion would follow the City Planning Commission's standard procedures with public notice, staff report, a public hearing recommendation, recommendation to the city council, council public hearings, and their own consideration. And that ends the presentation. All right, thank you, Paul, um, for that. Commissioners, do you have any questions as it relates to the outdoor study uh, for staff? I just wanna applaud the work. Uh, I think it's phenomenal work. Um, I think the shift in, in temporary permits is really well done. Uh, I think the zoning recommendations, especially the uh, additional uh, planning recommendations have been really well laid out. Um, it is uh, uh, fantastic um, that it's gotten to this point. And I really do appreciate the pause and the extra work that was put in on this. I know we uh, uh, gave a little extra time and it shows. Uh, and so I just am, am elated by the, the report that is present and being presented to us. And I look forward to the public comments. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to note that Emily Hernandez and Joseph Colon are both on the call and they are were both uh, uh, very strong members of the study team. Fantastic work, everybody. All right, any other uh, questions? Is Commissioner Lund? Um, yes, Paul, I agree with Kyle. This is complex and detailed and, and with a lot of nuances. And um, we've talked about it before, but this is really comprehensive approach. So hats off to you all in the midst of uh, limited resources doing this. A quick question about the um, in terms of enforcement of sound ordinances, do we have any mechanisms in place? Or is there a proposal? That's, I know that's not part of this, but do we have a, any mechanisms in place? So currently the sound ordinance is uh, enforced by the health department, but uh, as I mentioned during the presentation, they do have difficulty with the enforcement due to the, the way it's written, um, using standards such as clearly audible um, which you know may vary, may be subjective, vary from one person to another. Also, the points at which the the sound readings are supposed to be taken from are are from where it would be received, and there could be sound that is in between the uh, the location that's emanating the sound and the, sound, the location where it's being received. Or um, you know, if that was a block away, you would catch up catch a lot of ambient noise as well. So. Uh, they essentially enforce on a uh, complaint basis, and they will do readings on if if they need to. But you know they're they're somewhat uh, limited in what they can do. Okay, but and there's no proposal so far to modify that. Just continue. That. Well, the proposal is that the sound ordinance needs to be revised, and that would be uh, a very uh, intense process that would would require the availability of the health department staff, uh, law department, uh, as well as the general public. And, and that'll, that'll probably take, you know, at least a year by itself. Okay, because I just anticipate with the scope of this that we may be looking at that in the future. Yeah, thank you. So I, the, the, the phased approach recommended by the study includes taking another look at the way that uh, the, the standards would be written once we have a more workable sound ordinance so that we could depend more upon enforcing the sound ordinance as opposed to being very strict with hours of operation, which is what the, the study proposes now because it sounds hours of operation are, are, can be measured by anybody. Right, thank you, Paul. 
All right, any other comments or questions uh, for staff as it relates to the outdoor study? All right, if not, we'll continue on with our agenda, zoning docket 00321. Zoning docket 00321 is a request by city council motion to establish an Algiers Riverfront Overlay District, which would effectively take the place of the Algiers Riverfront Interim Zoning District, which is set to expire in March 2021. The proposed overlay would apply to all the properties along the riverfront in Algiers Point and Algiers Riverview neighborhoods. Implementation of the overlay would have the effect of restricting specific uses, limiting the allowable height of development, and altering the bonuses allowed through the riverfront overlay RIV2 Algiers subdistrict standards. The stated purpose of the overlay district is to preserve the character and integrity of the Algiers riverfront and to safeguard against uses and designs that are deemed detrimental to the historic properties in the vicinity. The motion offers three ways through which its intent can be achieved can be achieved, requesting that staff consider the option of one, downzoning the base zoning within the overlay, two, amending the riverfront overlay, RIV to Algiers subdistrict standards to eliminate or modify the height limit increase so that only an additional five feet beyond the height limit of the underlying zoning is allowed, or three, amending the riverfront overlay, RIV to Algiers subdistrict to add a possible parking bonus as a replacement for the current height limit increase or supplement to a reduced height limit increase. The proposed overlay is in an area with multiple zoning districts and future land use designations. The overlay as proposed would apply the same restrictions across these multiple districts in a manner, in a manner that would conflict with the intent of the master plan. Staff believes that a more tailored approach which responds to the underlying future land use designations and current land use is more appropriate in this case and would enable the proposed overlay to be consistent with the master plan. Staff finds that the best way to meet the intent of motion M2400 is by enacting the following. One, rezone the portion of the overlay designated in the master plan with a mixed use medium future land use, shifting this area from MU1 medium intensity mixed use to HUMU historic urban neighborhood mixed use district. Two, establish the Algiers riverfront height and use restriction overlay, which matches the request of the motion and would impact those areas with the mixed use high future land use designation, currently zoned MU2 and MI. This overlay would have the effect of limiting the maximum developable height within these areas to 60 feet and reducing the permitted uses in this area. However, staff recommends reducing the uses proposed to be restricted in the council motion to only one prohibited use and four conditional uses. Um, three, retain the bonuses described in the RIV2 Alger subdistrict, which covers both areas within the mixed use high and mixed use medium future land use designations and allows up to a maximum of 25 foot height limit increase above the height limit in the overlay district. Four, modify the boundaries of the overlay such that it would exclude the areas zoned OSN, HURD2, and one block currently zoned MU1, which is developed with the Entergy facility. And lastly, modify the name of this overlay to read Algiers Riverfront Use and Height Restriction Overlay in order to make it clear the effect of the overlay as separate and distinct from the Riverfront Overlay, RIV2, Algiers Subdistrict. Staff believes this modified scenario is the best way to meet the intent of the council motion and the intent of the master plan. The master plan describes an encouragement of high density development in the mixed use high future land use areas while identifying HUMU as a zoning district, district consistent with mixed use medium future land use. The recommended modifications also align with the urban design framework outlined within chapter 13 of the master plan, which calls for the restoration of traditional densities in order to restore a critical mass which supports walkability and convenient transit. Chapter 13 of the master plan also states that the city should take advantage of opportunities for high density uses in developing vacant land on higher ground and in areas where buildings can be flood resistant, which staff finds to be important for the Algiers Riverfront area. The recommended modifications limit height and uses while still supporting the creation of mixed use developments with appropriate uses and while incentivizing for affordable housing and green building standards throughout the area. With these modifications, the text amendment request is consistent with the master plan and meets the text amendment approval standards in the CDO. Therefore, staff recommends modified approval of zoning docket 00321. All right, thank you. Um, this um, docket matter was handled by city council motion, um, but the, is there um, anyone, from the, maybe the council here to speak on this zoning docket? If not, um, 
commissioners, if you have a comment or questions for staff, you may ask at this time. All right, if there's no further discussion, uh, we'll continue on to zoning docket 00821. Zoning docket 008-21 considers a conditional use for the operation of a wine shop in an existing mixed use structure at the 4200 block of Magazine Street in the HUB1 neighborhood commercial district and the Magazine Street use, use restriction overlay district. This is a densely developed walkable neighborhood with a variety of commercial, retail, and residential uses in the near vicinity. The applicant will lease the ground floor commercial tenant space in the existing mixed use structure, which measures approximately 1,530 square feet in total. The entirety of this area will be dedicated to the wine shop and the applicant intends to dedicate a small area for wine tasting and on-site conception of the wine sold on site. Um, and there will be a reception and storage area in the front of the retail space. Otherwise, the applicant proposes dedicating most of the retail area to wine racks and display of products. This configuration is aligned with the CZO's definition of a wine shop. The applicant is not proposing any substantial renovations or modifications to the existing structure, so any nonconformities uh, pertaining to the physical structure are um, legally inherited rights. Staff finds the applicant is generally compliant with the use standards for a wine shop found in section 20.3. PPP of the CZO or they will be required to do so through compliance with the provisos uh, recommended through the staff report. However, in writing this report, staff learned that chapter 10, article three and section 10-237A of the city's code Sorry, I'm ordinances. In the Which you need. Okay. Bye. That no permit shall be granted for retail sales of packaged alcoholic beverages within 300 feet of any playground, church, public library, school, funeral home or mortuary. Measured in accordance with section 10-238A, the subject property is within 300 feet of both the bilingual school of New Orleans at 821 General Pershing Street and the Church of St. Henry at 801 General Pershing Street. Safety and Permits has determined that wine shop falls within this category of retail sale of packaged liquor. And therefore, therefore, this use would not be permitted in this location according to city code as it's written. As of the date this report was written, city planning staff, safety and permits, and city council staff continue to discuss possible alternatives to the proposed wine shop that would allow the applicant to make use of the space while complying with city code. That said, the city planning staff does not find that the proposed use is in violation of any of the standards of the CZO. However, this matter concerning the city code may prevent the applicant from ultimately obtaining the appropriate license and permit for a wine shop from the Department of Safety and Permits. That said, staff finds that this proposed business will contribute to the pedestrian oriented and mixed use nature of this area and the proposal supports similar goals stated for this area and its future land use designation. Therefore, staff recommends approval of this conditional use application. All right, thank you. At this time, um, we have an applicant or a representative of the applicant present to discuss zoning docket 00821. Um, hello, I was trying to get the video on and it says that uh, the host has canceled that. So I'm also, I can't turn my volume up because of a technical problem, I think, with the presentation on the screen. It won't let me get to, so I hope, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, so we, we can oh. hear you fine. Okay. Um, you would state your name. Uh, Z Zella May, 2525 Burgundy Street, New Orleans, and I am representing the uh, property owner, and I do get compensated for doing so. Okay, you may, you may continue. Okay, um, I wanted to just point out a couple of things. Uh, from what I understand, the... Um, the city code that chapter 10 article 13 about the package liquor that's being worked out uh, currently with um, councilman banks and palmer i think that what they drafted was not the intent uh, to include um, wine shops and i also wanted to point out that um, 
the distance they we had the ATC go out and do a measurement and the bilingual school is 308 feet away from this entrance and the church that stated in the report is even further away from that so I I don't know how this is measured but we felt that having ATC out there they do this all the time so I don't know if that's an issue now the St. George's school um, that my both of my boys graduated from there they absolutely have no problem with a wine shop and so we haven't had any opposition so we think we're going to uh, resolve all the other issues we just need this city planning commission to approve um, the wine shop as a conditional use all right uh, thank you so much uh, Ms. may um, are, are there any questions um, for the applicant or uh, for staff for this zoning docket from any commissioner? I have a question. This is Commissioner Wittry. Mm -hmm. Ms. May, I know that you said that you didn't have any opposition from the one school, but there is another school just around the corner, a Cole by Ling. They wrote a letter of support, actually. It's in okay. the NPP report. They're very pro, I mean, they really were the ones that came out first to say they welcomed us to the neighborhood. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from um, any commissioner? All right, we'll continue on with the agenda. Uh, zoning docket 00921. Uh, this is a request for an amendment to ordinance number 20,902 MCS zoning docket 5702 and ordinance number 24,295, zoning docket 10410, for conditional use to permit the expansion of an existing educational facility in an HURD1 and HURD2 uh, historic urban two-family residential districts. Uh, there are multiple addresses along Jackson Avenue, Coliseum Street, Josephine Street, and Camp Street. Um, it's a request that we would consider another amendment to the previously approved development plan for Trinity Episcopal School to allow an addition to and renovation of the existing building and field improvements. At the time of the report, the staff was not able to review the, request in ch the requested changes because of any complete record. The recorded plans for zoning docket 10 are not available. And therefore, staff is working with the Department of Safety and Permits to determine the current ent entitlement of the site. The staff, therefore, is recommending deferral to the February 23rd uh, City Planning Commission meeting. All right, thank you. Do we have a representative from, uh, from Trinit Trinity with us? Or a representative uh, from Trinity Church? Do we have a representative from Trinity Church? All right. If not, uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for staff as it relates to this zoning docket 00921? There's no further discussion on zoning docket 00921. We'll continue on in the agenda to subdivision docket 13320. Subdivision docket 13320 is a request to consolidate lots 26A, 27A, 5, 6, and B1 into lot B2 in an HURM1 historic or urban multifamily residential district and an HURD1 historic urban two-family residential district. The proposal would reconfigure the five existing lots of record into a single lot of record with frontages on St. Charles Avenue, First Street, Britannia Street, and Phillip Street. The site is currently used as the Luis S. McGee School, which utilizes all structures on the site for administrative or educational purposes. The consolidation of lots would match the lot boundaries with the hom homogeneous use of the parcel. However, the proposed three subdivision would create a new lot of record with split zoning. 
The four existing lots fronting St. Charles Avenue are located in an HURM1 historic urban multifamily residential district. And the larger existing lot with frontage on Britannia Street is located in an HURD1 historic urban two family residential district. CPC staff typically is not supportive of split zoned lots as it can create ambiguity with different use and design regulations. Oftentimes, the creation of a split zoned lot necessitates a subsequent zoning change. In this case, however, the split zoned lot wouldn't affect the use or the design of the buildings. The entire property has similar zoning regulations, even though it is split between two zoning districts. Institutional uses have the same regulations in both the HURD1 and HURM1 districts. Therefore, the typical concern of split zoned parcels is less of a concern in this situation. In addition, the majority of the parcel is governed by an existing conditional use. Conditional use requirements supersede the base zoning district regulations. So um, it would provide another layer of consistency throughout the parcel, negating the need for a zoning change. In addition to the split zoning consideration, the subdivision also involves the creation of a double frontage lot. The subdivision regulations include exceptions under which such lot conditions may be approved. The proposed double frontage lot would not create a substantial deviation in the lot pattern of other institutional uses in the vicinity, where it is common for large residential or institutional developments to be situated on a larger consolidated lot with multiple frontages. Therefore, the staff recommends tentative approval of subdivision docket 133-20 with final approval subject to three provisos. Okay, thank you. I'm at this time now, is there a representative from uh, McGee School with us? Yes. All right, um, Mr. Shields, you have three minutes. Please state your name and address for the record and also um, state uh, why you're representing the, um, the applicant as well, or your, or your relationship to the applicant. Thanks. Sonny Shields, uh, I live at 1209 Washington Avenue in New Orleans. Uh, I'm an attorney representing the uh, school and simply put together the application. Uh, as the staff has reported, this is simply a consolidation of an existing use. I think the staff report sets it all out and I'll be happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. All right, thank you, Mrs. Shields. Um, commissioners, are there any questions for Mrs. Shields or uh, for staff as it relates to this subdivision docket? docket. All right, if there are no questions, we'll continue on. Thank you, Mr. Shields, for joining us. Uh, we'll go to subdivision docket 136.20. Next item is subdivision docket 136.20. This is a request to resubdivide square 31, lot 31 XYZ into lots 105, 106, 107, 108, 19, 110, all the way through 118. This major subdivision, which is, a, which is a subdivision that creates more than five lots and or a street is reviewed under policy, policy C in accordance with article three, section 323 sub, of the subdivision regulations. The applicant proposes to resubdivide the existing lot 31 XYZ into lots 105 to 118. The lots are currently vacant and the applicant is proposing to resubdivide in order to construct 14 single family residences on the proposed lots. The lots proposed by the applicant will measure between 47.5 feet and 40 feet in width and between 92 feet and 151 feet in depth. The proposed dimensions of the lots 105 through 118 would be consistent with the generally long and somewhat narrow residential lots in the surrounding neighborhood. Additionally, the applicant was recently approved to resubdivide neighboring lots 101 through 104 into lots similar to those currently proposed. Side is on SRD suburban two family residential district and based on the lot sizes, all the lots would be eligible for development with single family residents, two family residences and townhouse developments. Staff recommends approval of subdivision dot, docket 13620 with final approval subject to four provisos and one waiver. All right, thank you. Do we have a representative from uh, Crowder Boulevard properties with us? Yes, sir. My name is Ricardo Tenorio, a member of Spectrum Designs, 2439 Manhattan Boulevard, on behalf of Crowder Street Development. And I'm just here to answer any questions the staff might may have regarding this free subdivision. All right. Thank you. So at this time now, does the, any commissioner uh, have any questions uh, for, um, for the applicant rep representative or for staff as it relates to this subdivision docket? 
All right, if there are no questions, we'll continue um, on with our agenda and move to subdivision docket 137.20. Subdivision docket 137.20 is a request to resubdivide lot D3 and lot four into lot D3A and lot 4A located in the VCR1 Bucare residential district. The proposal would redraw the lot line between two lots of common ownership in order to add a yard and driveway to 721 Governor Nickel Street and create a separate lot for 729 Governor Nickel Street. Proposed lot D3A is an irregularly shaped lot with approximately 14,125 square feet. Proposed lot 4A is a rectangular shaped 1,890 square foot lot. The subdivision regulations do not include policies which permit the proposed subdivision to be approved administratively due to its location in the view carré. Therefore, the subdivision must be considered by the City Planning Commission. The two proposed lots are compliant with the lot size requirements of the CZO and meet all applicable requirements of the subdivision regulations. There will be no change in the number of units located on each lot, simply a different configuration of the driveway and yard, which were previously used as a fish market. With the subdivision, the driveway and yard would be put into use as off-street parking and a yard for the units at 721 Governor Nichols. The proposal does not create any non-compliance with the subdivision regulations or the CCO, and though proposed lot D3A would be irregularly shaped, this is simply a reconfiguration of the existing irregularity in the lot shape. Therefore, staff recommends tentative approval of subdivision docket 13720, subject to three provisos. All right, thank you. Um, at this time now, do we have a representative or... Um, President for, um, for Thomas Reagan. Uh, Thomas Reagan, are you with us? Um, I am Caleb Bardwell. I'm here representing John Williams Architects and the property owners. All right. Uh, please state your uh, address for the record and if you're being paid in, in connection with this application. Um, it's 824 Barone Street. And yes, we are. Um, at this time, you have three minutes, or if you're just here for questions. I'm here for any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. All right, thank you. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions um, for the applicant representative or staff as it relates to subdivision docket 137.20? Um, if there are no questions, thank you for, um, for, for being with us. Um, and at this time now, um, the public uh, comments um, can be taken. So, if you're listening uh, in connection to any of these document matters that we heard today, you have an opportunity to, to voice your public comment um, by filling out the public comment uh, card. Um, and the time now is 2:21. And as I've stated in the rules, um, the commission will take a 30-minute recess and then come back and hear public comment, and then uh, uh, take action on the document matter that we heard today. So, at this time now, is there a motion uh, by a commissioner? Um, for a 30 minute recess. Yes, Commissioner Lon, I move for a 30 minute recess and uh, come back at, uh, that would be 2.51. Is there a second to that motion? Commissioner, second. I've been moved by Commissioner Lon for a 30 minute recess to 2.51. Uh, and it's been seconded by, uh, was that Commissioner Wittry? Mobley. Sorry. Commissioner Mobley. Um, so at this time, there are no further discussion on, on that motion. Um, I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner Lund? Yes. Commissioner Marshall? Yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. Commissioner Steve? Commissioner Steve? Commissioner Steve has raised his hand in support. Uh, Commissioner Stewart. There it yes. is. I was trying to unmute. Yes. <laughs> All right. Commissioner Stewart votes yes. Commissioner Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Witchery. Yes. All right. So at this time now, we will take a 30 uh, minute recess and reconvene at 2.51.
Okay, commissioners, the time now is 2.52. Um, so we can reconvene back for, from, um, from recess. Um, at this time, let's check our emails to see if we received any public comment. We have received public comment. All right, so let's have a roll call so that we can continue on um, with our meeting. Commissioner Brown. I'm here. I didn't get the email. Who was it from? Um, from Stephen. From Stephen, okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, Y'all go on. I will wait for it. Okay. All right. Commissioner Flick. Present. Commissioner Lund. Present. Commissioner Marshall. Commissioner Mobley. <clears throat> Commissioner Stieg. Here. Commissioner Stewart is present. Commissioner Weberg and Commissioner Wittry. Wittry is Weberg. present. As is Commissioner Weberg. All right. All right. So at this time now, commissioners, we can start um, looking at the public comment. And Paul, we'll start with um, our first document of the outdoor live entertainment study. Very good. <clears throat> uh, the first comment is from Brian Luckett, 936 Gallier Street, in opposition. This motion puts the cart before the horse. We need an enforceable sound ordinance first. When the ordinance for outdoor live entertainment is written, it needs to be equally applicable across the city and not restricted to only some neighborhoods. Next from Ethan Alistad, representing the Music and Culture Coalition of New Orleans in support. We want to thank the City Planning Commission staff for taking a thoughtful, undertaking a thoughtful study about outdoor live entertainment and appreciate that it is broad in scope. It suggests both immediate zoning and land use changes, but also includes a number of suggestions that would help create a stronger support system for cultural activity throughout city government. In particular, we appreciate the inclusion of the recommendation for a nightlife entertainment cultural economy advocate position and a music and culture advisory board commission, as well as recentering the culture -centr centric elements added to the city's master plan in 2017, most of which have not yet been implemented. Since the plan was deferred in December, we have had a number of conversations regarding the suggested changes to the zoning and land use regulations and the general consensus we have heard from musicians and venue owners has been that the proposed hours end too early. They need to be extended at least another hour and two to three nights per week is too restrictive, particularly for businesses in non-residential areas. There needs to be greater flexibility to better meet the needs of various neighborhoods and business models. We've also talked to several neighborhood associations who are quite concerned about event and wedding venues, particularly those that are in or abut residential areas and generally catered to out of town guests. We would suggest these need to be regulated differently than neighborhood serving businesses that may also feature outdoor live entertainment. Once again, thank you for a study that examines a number of sides of what can be a controversial issue. We are happy to keep working with you as it moves forward and these recommendations are further refined. Next from Mark Childress, 931 Orleans Avenue in opposition. Thank you for giving me a chance to respond to the city's 92 page study of possible expansion of outdoor live music in the French Quarter and other neighborhoods. I speak in support of the VC Pora position, which is, uh, is that the issues of temporary changes in response to the COVID pandemic should be separated from permanent zoning changes and the expansion of live music. I agree with um, um, Mr. Chad Pellerin's objections that once again, city planners seem to have completely ignored residents of the French Quarter while making plans that will completely change and damage our quality of life. Why weren't resident groups included in the process? It is illegal for you to pass changes without sufficient efforts to allow public comment. I would add an observation. The fairgrounds has sat empty for the entirety of the pandemic and all the tents that make up the Jazz Fest are sitting in a warehouse somewhere. 
The fairgrounds is a great venue for live music. If the city planner used a bit of imagination, couldn't the tents and fairgrounds be used to establish a real place for musicians to play outdoors with appropriate social distancing during the pandemic? We are the greatest live music city in the USA and the city has done nothing for musicians during this time. Next from Glade Bilby, 632 North Rampart, representing French Quarter citizens in opposition. French Quarter Citizens Organization is very concerned with the proposed changes to the C by the CBC to the upcoming legislation related to outdoor live entertainment and sound. Even though the ordinance is to affect the entire city, it is particularly problematic to the French Quarter due to the overwhelming number of venues that will be allowed to operate within the small geographic boundaries of the quarter. One of the overwhelming concerns is the lack of input that by the very citizens these proposed changes will most affect the residents of the French Quarter. As stakeholders in this process, along with musicians of our great city, we should have adequate time to meet and discuss these proposals that not only change zoning in our neighborhood, but impact the quality of life here and in the entire city. We feel the changes to the city zoning laws should protect residential parts of the French Quarter and not make it more burdensome to coexist with the proliferation of bars and music venues that these proposed changes would encourage. As a stated goal from the executive summary to reduce any unintended secondary effect relative to the cultural and residential fabric of the city, we must demand more input from the residents of the French Quarter specifically before rewriting and adopting any of these overreaching proposed changes to the city's zoning laws. Next from Jean Nathan, 2326 Esplanade Avenue in opposition. <clears throat> Live music in the streets and venues of New Orleans is core to our cultural uniqueness and should not only be permitted but encouraged with thoughtful planning that identifies locations where music can be presented without being intrusive for residents. It would be optimum for live music and for encouraging cultural tourism throughout the neighborhoods of the city to carefully explore appropriate sites, funding, transportation connections, and relationships with adjacent commercial areas that could benefit from cultural performances and events. Planning for how to address live music outdoors in New Orleans should proceed with community engagement clarity about how the plan might be executed with nuanced consideration of how to develop cultural sites for performance and other events that do no harm to residents and is enforceable. Allowing live music, especially amplified three days a week, every week year long in any neighborhood where an entity has been able to secure a conditional use is punishing and will push more residents out of the city. Let's do the right thing, defer consideration of this study and convene musicians, culture bearers, producers and neighborhood leaders to develop a strategy for how to present music throughout the city in a way that doesn't sacrifice residents and puts our culture bearers, musicians, and creatives to work. <clears throat> Next from Ashley Keaton, 400 Esplanade Avenue, would like to provide or request more information regarding this application. My name is Ashley Keaton. I'm a local intellectual property attorney and advocate for cultural continuity in New Orleans, co-founder and supervising attorney for the Ella Project, professor at Tulane Law and UNO, homeowner and tax paying res taxpayer residing in the Lower Garden District, former board member for the Coliseum Square Neighborhood Association, chair of the WWOZ 90.7 FM Community Advisory Board, co-founder of Music Policy Forum, co-captain of the national leadership team and local pilot on reopening every venue safely, former for board member an officer for the Recording Academy, former member of the Creative Industries Subcommittee for Mayor Cantrell's transition team, among other ways I participate in the cultural sector and our local community. I'm also a patron of the New Orleans art, music, and culture, which means I support New Orleans artists, musicians, and culture bearers. I have worked for many years with local musicians, artists, Mardi Gras Indians, social aid and pleasure clubs, and many other folks who are critical to a thriving cultural ecosystem in New Orleans. I would like to express my gratitude to the City Planning Commission for producing a document that includes uh, voluminous information and recommendations ar around expanding upon the municipality's cultural infrastructure, including material in connection with the document's title and suggested contents focusing on outdoor live entertainment. Beyond outdoor live entertainment, the study recommends policies, programs, and procedures, some of which myself, along with others, have been asking the city to consider for years now. I'm grateful that this study addresses some concerns and proposed solutions around striking a balance and promoting our cultural economy and ecosystem with reasonable regulation. I'm particularly pleased to see a recommended nightlife advocate position, which has proven to be beneficial to communities across North America and the globe. I am directly involved with working with city officials to understand the various ways this office can serve to promote a healthier economy and quality of life for those who work and live here. 
for today. My substantive comments are limited to some of the more granular recommendations within the study specific to outdoor live entertainment. I believe the study generally presents a good starting point and shows a pathway toward creating reasonable guidelines for outdoor live entertainment. However, there are several adjustments I recommend initially to reconcile the study's recommendations with the way our cultural traditions, workforce, and economy are manifested, continued, and reasonably regulated in the context of custom and practice among the governing and governed in New Orleans, a city that has been shaped by custom and practice for over 300, 300 years. To that end, I suggest there is a huge distinction between what are considered special events and event venues like wedding and- Time, Paul? Yes. Time. Next comment. Next comment is from Ashley. Shabankara in opposition. I appreciate the in-depth review of the outdoor live entertainment regulations in New Orleans. In general, I think this is a good study and a great starting point towards responsible, consistent guidelines for outdoor live entertainment. However, I feel there are several recommendations that require further review. The hours of operation should be uniformly extended by one hour. 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. is too early a cutoff for live entertainment, especially on Fridays and Saturdays. A limit of two to three nights per week is too restrictive for venues, especially those in commercial areas. There needs to be more of a distinction between event venues and other forms of outdoor live entertainment. While I'm glad to see a number of great recommendations, including the establishment of a nightlife entertainment advocate and the creation of a music culture advisory group, providing a tangible connection to the culture, we need to create pathways for outdoor live entertainment to happen in a post COVID world, updating zoning and land use and matching the cultural norms of our city along the way. Next from Shelley Landrew, representing the Garden District Association in opposition. Several comments. One, on behalf of the Garden District Association, I ask for deferral so that neighborhoods will, that will be affected by this change have time to study and comment. There has not been enough public input for such major change to be considered fully. Two, it seems that the CPC is recommending a permanent change to solve a temporary problem. Two issues are included here, relief for musicians and venues related to the pandemic and long-term possibilities for other li outdoor live, uh, live outdoor music venues. They should be considered separately. Three, please clarify if these venues and permits can be given in zones that currently cannot have live music yeah. or only where live music is now allowed. Does this override the base zoning? All right, that's fine. Uh, Sandra Stokes, uh, Louisiana Landmark Society, providing more information. Everyone loves music, particularly New Orleans music and Louisiana Landmark Society understands the hardships musicians are experiencing due to the pandemic. The ability and agility to utilize opportunities for performances is important during these extraordinary times. We also realize that the pandemic has forced residents to remain home more than ever and that their quality of life is essential to the, their well-being. There is a delicate balance in the ability to create opportunities for musicians to earn a living in the ability of residents to live and work at home in peace. We support a temporary opportunity for outdoor live music, but encourage using this as a learning period to gather information on what works and what doesn't, as each street of each neighborhood presents a unique situation. And with this trial period, we strongly support definitive and enforceable limits as to the times of performances, duration, number of days per week, volume of music, and how many are allowed per block. We believe it is important to separate this emergency situation due to the pandemic from the process of making text amendments to the CZO. No text amendments should be considered until a good sound ordinance is established. And a good sound ordinance must be accompanied with good enforcement or it will not work. Any movement at this time to change the CZO is extremely premature. Let's help the musician, but use this to learn if and how outdoor live entertainment works in residential neighborhoods. Next from Heidi, Schmalbach, Arts Council, New Orleans, in support. I support CPC approval of the outdoor live entertainment study. The study contains good recommendations for expanding opportunities for live outdoor entertainment, which can translate to increased economic opportunities for musicians, culture bearers, and other local artists. In particular, the implementation of, a cultural, of cultural recommendations already in the master plan, establishment of music and culture advisory group to help uh, guide policy development and creation of a community-led conflict resolution process for challenges surrounding entertainment venues and help support and protect our cultural resources and assets. In the next phase, consideration should be given to the nuances between types of venues and locations that may warrant later performance hours or increased number of days per week. Live entertainment is permitted. Thank you. Next 
next is from Greg Lucas, 726 St. Peter Street, in support. On behalf of the undersigned, we'd like to submit the following comment related to outdoor live entertainment study that was presented for approval at the City Planning Commission meeting taking place Tuesday, January 26. In general, we applaud the effort of the City of New Orleans to support the local cultural economy, which is responsible for significant expenditures and goodwill in the city by locals and millions of tourists who visit each year. We strongly agree that the Nightlife Advocate Position Survey of Cultural Important Sites and music and cultural advisory group will greatly benefit musicians, venues, and the general public. We look forward to participating in the execution of those recommendations. We hope that the City Planning Commission and City Council will move ahead with the following recommendations immediately. The city should take a more prominent role in promoting New Orleans cultural and live entertainment. Create a music and cultural advisory group or commission with representatives from the musician and venue community. Establish a nightlife entertainment cultural economy advocate as an independent office. Conduct a comprehensive survey of existing musically, historically, and spiritually important cultural sites that should be, should be completed and sites should become eligible for protection. We also support streamlining special event permitting processes and engaging in community involvement at the neighborhood level for updating the ordinances related to outdoor live entertainment. However, we believe that there are several recommendations that require further stakeholder, specifically musician and venue older in, uh, involvement. The sentiment is particularly related to the limitations on the number of allowed events per week, three max, and the hours of standard operation, especially for weekend evenings ending at 10 p.m. Once those initial recommendations are implemented, the zoning related recommendations will be much better informed and supported by the wider industry and community. Thank you for your consideration. We look forward to the process envisioned by the study. Greg Lucas, Executive Director, Preservation Hall Foundation. Next from Alan Johnson, representing FMIA in support of this application. Uh, we would like to thank the staff for their work on this issue. We think that there are many positives such as a 9 p.m. curfew and facing the stage away from residential districts. We'd like to state our concern about making any CZO changes until the temporary permit program be completed and all parties be allowed to have feedback. Secondly, there is much conversation at the end of the report regarding positions overseeing these establishments uh, AKA a nightmare or committee, we urge you to, to appoint not just musicians and club owners, but representatives from neighborhood associations such as FMIA, BCPORA, LGDA, NFB, BNA, and FQC, et cetera. Next from Michael Duplanche, 820 Barone Street in opposition. The commission must be cherry in its deliberations with respect to any proposed text change at a time when citizens are unable to avail themselves of the traditional means by which to participate in the public affairs of its elected and appointed officials. No text change should be considered during a period of truncated uh, public participation, especially when short-term alternatives to permanent change may be available. That recommended policy response should especially be observed where issues of quality of life of our neighborhoods are at risk, such as with live music. All neighborhoods, including my neighborhood of Lafayette Square, have had at one time or another serious issues and problems with bars and with live music. It is often a volatile and difficult conflict that commands careful and circumspect deliberation by public officials. Given that, no change to the carefully calibrated public policy, policy should be considered at this time, and I urge the Commission to adopt that position. Next from Chad Pellerin, 819 Orleans Avenue in opposition, having difficulty sending comment forwarded last evening by email. Next from Julie Jones, Neighbors First for Bywater in opposition. The Board of Neighbors First for Bywater has voted to oppose the recommendations put forth in this study. First, it seems premature to promote outdoor live music when, as the study admits, the city has no workable sound ordinance and no means of enforcement in place. This means that such enforcement as there, as there is will fall about individual residents and intolerable imposition. Allowing largely unregulated, unregulated outdoor music will become a major quality of life issue to those of us who continue to live in the city. The proposal to allow eight to nine hours of music a day for up to three days a week could make life miserable for anyone within hearing range, and that is a wide range. The suggestion that any place that was once, when, for how long, a music venue could once again be 
visa means that people who have in, innocently purchased a house, without, a house without researching the histories of all nearby properties may find themselves in an untenable situation. Yes, we want to support our musicians, but this proposal has been not been well thought out. I join my board in urging the commission to reject it. Thank you. Next from Hannah Krieger Benson, uh, providing more information. Dear CPC, in general, this is a good and in-depth study that presents a starting point and shows a path toward creating reasonable guidelines for outdoor live entertainment in New Orleans. However, there are several adjustments needed to better reflect the needs and cultural norm of the city. This study needs more comprehensively to reflect the organic rhythms of cultural practices as well as the needs of non-musician residents. These adjustments will help avoid setting up scenarios where our local cultural traditions are at risk of being treated as nuisances or criminal activity. The hours of operation need to be uniformly extended by one hour with an option for extension via provisos or a conditional use. 8 or 9 p.m. is simply too early a cutoff and not reasonably reasonable to abide by on weekdays. Shows uh, we would have to start by 6 p.m. at the latest, which is not feasible. A uniform limit of two to three nights per week is too restrictive, particularly for venues that are in a commercial area and have built in outdoor live entertainment as a major part of their business model. There needs to be either a more st stepped approach, venues and commercial industrial zoning allowed to have more events or a built-in conditional use mechanism that will create greater flexibility here. Again, the concern is that overly restrictive guidelines will stifle and potentially criminalize cultural activity and further a recent trend towards limiting the practices uh, by legal regulation. Three, there needs to be further separation between event venues and other forms of outdoor live entertainment, particularly in residential areas. Event venues generally cater to a very temporary clientele with few ties to the surrounding area, while neighborhood restaurants, bars, and venues tend to have a recurring schedule of events and patrons that are invested in the livability of the location. This distinction will help tackle the very real concerns that event venues can raise while simultaneously nurturing neighborhood cultural spaces to ensure their continued existence as crucial cultural incubators. We are glad to see the inclusion of a number of suggestions such as the creation of a nightlife advocate position which would further support the city's cultural community. Next from Jeffrey Seymour, 2227 Royal Street would like to provide more information. Any zoning ordinances at the very least should include reasonable and enforceable curfew restrictions in instances where outdoor entertainment abuts residential neighborhoods. In addition, any ordinances be directed away from abutting residential districts and neighborhoods. Next from Aaron Holmes representing VC Pora, would like to provide more information. Dear commissioners, I write to ask you to examine the full recommendations of this study and realistic parts with emphasis added to our current context. Today's needs are very different from when the study was initiated. Businesses and cultural economy absolutely need more opportunities for survival in the short term given indoor capacity restrictions. This is why a discussion of extending temporary special event permits needs to be happened before, not in conjunction with the consideration of permanent changes to the CZO. A recommendation to expand special event permits from eight per year to three times per week at 600 percent increase should seek more community vetting, particularly as no zoning district restrictions have been recommended. What might be an appropriate expansion in a commercial corridor could have far more intense repercussions in a residential district where businesses may operate as a conditional use, a legal non-conforming use, or a neighborhood commercial establishment. Further, the safeguards recommended to mitigate adverse impacts like hours of operation and buffer zones need to take into account the severely reduced enforcement capacity of the city at this time. Study recognizes the lack of a workable sound ordinance as a major complication in ensuring peaceful cohabitation of outdoor live entertainment and its neighbors. Without one in place and a demonstrated commitment to enforcing it, the consideration of permanent CZO text amendment to expand outdoor live entertainment is putting the cart before the horse. We hope that you will agree that the city needs a way to realistically enforce measures designed to ensure balanced interests before loosening the regulations. Uh, it appears to be the last comment. All right, thank you so much for reading those comments uh, into the record. Um, at this time now, uh, commissioners, do you have any follow-up um, for staff uh, or any comments about any public comment um, that we would just um, bring to the record? 
This is Commissioner Mobley. I have a series of questions for staff, Paul. How long has this study been in the works? Well, it was initiated, I believe, in, in January of 2020, before the pandemic started. Uh, we did have to request extensions, um, or at least one extension, um, through December. And uh, so most of the study was conducted uh, during the pandemic, which is when we you know, added the consideration of the pandemic to the study. How many meetings have you guys had in compiling this report? I don't have the list in front of me, but I'd say approximately 15. Rough estimate. How many public comment periods have we had on this report? Well, we've had, uh, this is the third public hearing. Um, the first one was in March of 2020. Um, then we received public comments throughout the, the summer um, and had, sec had our second public hearing on December 8th. And then um, the public hearing now, We, I don't have a, Exact number of public comments, but um, you know, probably at least a dozen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Are there any other comments or questions from any other commissioner for, for staff as it relates to um, the outdoor live entertainment study? Yeah, I, I have a question because I think I think some of the the comments are speaking about um, you know bad actors potentially and potentially those bad actors being in residential neighborhoods um th this is an th this is the the two to three nights a week understood that that in 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 different parts of the city that intensity could could have different impacts that said it's an annual process so if someone is is uh uh shown to be an abuser of this process or a bad actor inside of this process Theoretically, they won't get approved for their next uh, permit. Correct, Paul? That's correct. Uh, that's um, that is really one of the reasons that we recommended the the pilot program for the the temporary use permit expansion, uh, because a temporary permit can be revoked. Um, I, I think it could be even revoked, you know, before the all of the different occasions have been um, have happened. Um, so. You know, if they were early on in the process, had had violated the hours of operation multiple times, uh, the the permits for later in the year could be revoked. Um, Thank the, you. And the, the you know the two to three times per per week is also you know the very nature of saying two or three indicates that you know we believe there should be some flexibility, um, and as well as uh, hours of operation are could be considered flexible either by neighborhood zoning district or and especially considering the using later hours in the arts and cultural overlay districts. Thank you, Paul. All right, are there any um, further comments or questions for staff from any commissioner? I have a question. There seem to be a few comments related to the noise ordinance not being ready for even the pilot program here. Um, I have my thoughts about that, but wondered if the staff could comment about some of them saying that the card is being put before the horse on this. So, um, yeah, we, we recognized early on that the, there are problems with the noise or, or sound ordinance. And so what we look to regulate the uses by our were hours of operation, days a week. Um, and so that is why we we chose sort of somewhat limited um, hours of operation, especially on weekdays. Um, <clears throat> and why the the pilot program of temporary permits was suggested, because as I mentioned, the, those are something that could be revoked if there were bad actors. Thank you. Paul, my understanding is that the noise ordinance falls under the purview of the health department. What's your best estimate of when the health department might be willing to take that up as an issue while they are attempting to juggle and contain a global pandemic in a tourist city? Well, probably when we have herd immunity. That's like 70% of Americans being right. So uh, I've heard that that is that being later this year. 
it might be a minute. Yes. Any additional comments or questions? Um, yes, Commissioner Lund. Um, so what are, for staff, what are some of the reasons for or sense of urgency for implementing any of this? Because I, I do have particular concerns about enforcement. You know, the hours that would require enforcement are for the health department. I imagine they do not have much staff available mm -hmm at the hours that would require enforcing um, sound ordinances. So if you can help me understand um, the need or any particularly strong reasons for not holding off un until this could have a better enforcement mechanism and perhaps more input. Well, what is, um, what's going on right now is that the, you know, many of the music venues uh, bars and restaurants uh, are already providing outdoor live entertainment through the through the event special event permit process the mayor has suspended the limitation on that so uh, we are are thinking that that would should just be extended for a year so that people can plan ahead um, and recoup some of the the losses to their businesses and to their livelihoods um, we did, you know, get this study request from the, the city council. So they, they were obviously wanting to make some changes to the, the regulations around outdoor live entertainment, which is extremely limited um, in, in where it can be now. So, uh, and I think that the, the study re recommends a phased approach uh, where we could look just at the temporary special event permits for for the foreseeable future and then get into some of the details about the permanent CZO tax changes later. If I could add to that, um, and I think we need to go back. This was a study that was initiated before the pandemic and it was initiated under the premise that the current regulations governing outdoor live entertainment aren't working. They're not working for musicians. They're not working for neighbors. They're not working for venue owners. Um, they're not understandable. They're, um, they're not clear. And, and so the urgency for the study was to come up with some regulations around regulations that at least could be clear enough so that everyone knew where they stood. And so after the study, so, so and that, that's still an issue. If, if nothing is done right now, we're left with regulations that don't work. And so, um, so what we're suggesting um, is let's put some regulations in that are clear, that are thought out, are mindful of the fact that a large component of the um, overall scheme, um, the sound ordinance, is, is something else that that doesn't work, but that's not necessarily in our purview and, and, and needs to be worked on. And the city is, you know, indicated that it is going to move forward when it has the ability to do so. So I, I think to your question, um, the urgency that, that we see is that now that we are in a position where um, for the foreseeable future, outdoor live entertainment is a lifeline that a lot of musicians are gonna need going forward, is to put some regulations in place that make sense and, and are at least clear and, and may need tweaking over time, but, but that are um, much better than, the, um, than what is in the ordinance right now. Oh, thank you. And, and one other question, the, the, time, uh, the time frame for stopping music does seem very early in terms of, you know, uh, is, eight, is it 8 p.m. weekdays, 9 p.m. weekends? Uh, I'm just wondering how it came up that, and is that actually helpful to musicians? Will they you know, be able to perform and end in that time and have it be uh, financially viable? Well, we did hear, get comments, as you heard, um, that, it, that 8 p.m. was too early on a weeknight um, because they wouldn't 
really get going until 6 p.m. Um, but uh, city planning staff was, was trying to balance that with, uh, you know, the, the neighbors and, uh, and other nearby uh, uses. This is Commissioner Flick. I would, I would be in favor of extending that by an hour. Um, it just seems like I agree with Commissioner Lund. I think the, the time is incredibly early. Um, you know, you're, you're in the middle of dinner. And also to re reiterate, it doesn't mean that the music stops. It just means that the music can no longer go on outside, correct? So if there is an inside space for music, the music can continue there. That's right. All these recommendations are about outdoor music. I would also support adding an additional hour. Um, so so I'll, I have a question for staff. I think so, most of those comments as related to time uh, were like really directed to residential areas. Um, what about the thoughts of uh, in commercial um, spaces, uh, say particularly like downtown or maybe um, industrial or, you know, uh, uh, a venue that's set up for particularly for outdoor entertainment, um, how would that actually affect um, the time regulation affect them if they're set up primarily for outdoor venues or like what, a weddings, uh, maybe a concert, or how would they be affected? So I, I think that that's something that we, we could definitely consider that um, hours of operation could be different depending on the zoning district uh, and then we we also do have some language in the study about the, the distance from residential. Uh, so if it was, say, at least 600 feet or 300 feet from residential, um, hours of operation could go longer there. I think those were kind of our, that was our thinking in terms of the permanent changes to the CZO, that if those were listed as standards, uh, that that could be something that was adjusted on a case by case basis, but we could also look at at the zoning districts and the distance from residential as as automatically allowing longer hours. Paul, this is a, a study. So talk about what next steps are, whatever this this commission in its in its decision making process votes on what comes after this. Uh, so we would uh, incorporate your comments into the minutes for the study, uh, send the study on to the city council, which, which requested the study. Uh, and then it's up to them. They, uh, they could have a hearing and have, a, have us present. They could uh, take it to a committee. They could decide to implement just portions of the, of the study by uh, sending us a motion for text amendments. Um, you know, they don't, they can reject parts of it and keep other parts. Thank you, Paul. All right. Any further comments or questions? For Commissioner Marshall, um, I would, I would support the idea of increasing the hour in certain uh, districts or distances automatically uh, away from residential. Uh, I live in a, a pretty quiet neighborhood now, but as I, I think about this prop that climbed up in my, my lap, uh, that extra hour in residential areas uh, certainly is, is meaningful. Uh, but in areas where you are, are zoned for commercial or zoned differently, I think it would be appropriate to automatically extend that hour or to have those comments forwarded on um, as part of this study. Uh, the only other thing that I, I'd like to add before we vote to, to sort of move this this forward is the, the sound ordinance and this issue, I know it was something that came up uh, in 2020 uh, before the pandemic, but it's also something that we've been uh, addressing in some form or fashion since I joined this commission as a young man with no children and no gray hair in my beard. Uh, so it's it's been, it's been going on for quite some time. So I, I, I just wanna acknowledge that um, for comments on both sides, it may not be um, a perfect study. It may not be everything that everyone has wanted, but it is, it is certainly an attempt to address a problem uh, that has existed for as long as I've served on this commission. 
All right. Well, as you're putting, as, as, as we're having this dialogue about, about those, those kind of nuances in between the commercial district and the residential, I think commercial and cultural overlay districts should be synonymous, right? That, that in this, in this instance, um, we do have some, some areas of this city, um, uh, one in this name, one in my neighborhood uh, on the St. Claude corridor, but a number of them around the city where I think it's actually really appropriate um, to have those expanded hours and to have uh, that that expanded ability because that's what they're there for. Um, so I think the commercial and the cultural overlay districts make a lot of sense uh, to be included uh, as expansions. And then the the ones that are more residential, um, um, uh, absolutely. Um, I think that is one of the comments we saw consistently, uh, and consistently from people that are are in support of. Of, of making sure that we have uh, live music venues and have um, um, musicians employed and culture bearers uh, able to uh, come back uh, from, from, from this, this unin, uh, uh, uninvited hibernation of, of employment and make a living. And so I think, I think putting the cultural overlay districts with that commercial is important. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm, so I'm taking the, the reference to commercial districts as being the more intense commercial districts as opposed to the kind that might be on a neighborhood corner everything except the uh the four surrounding blocks from commissioner marshall's house that's correct so um paul as we move forward with this um i mean i i would be prepared to make a motion but i'm wondering if it's best to um Without, well, without making the motion, I'm going to ask this question. Forwarding the whole study and with the commission's comments, it seems that we are somewhat in concert about those more intense commercial districts and the cultural overlays, but sending the whole study as is, is that sort of where we're going with this or do we want to actually modify what we send in the recommendations to the council? I Think it could be done as the the former option that you mentioned okay well i'm prepared unless are there are more questions and comments all means commissioner brown um i move we send the study excellent job staff to the council um with um consideration being given to extending hours in the commercial, heavy commercial and cultural overlay districts. Commissioner Mobley, I'll second. Um, thank you staff for doing just a tremendous outreach job under some incredibly rough conditions. It's really impressive. Okay, it's been moved by Commissioner Brown to move the study to City Council um, with a note from the added um, about increasing hours in particularly in commercial and cultural um, districts. It's been second, second by Commissioner Mobley. Is there any further discussion on, on the motion uh, on the floor? Any further? I, I, I voiced my, my uh, um, gratitude to the staff before. I do want to say, I think for us to get to something that that starts to, to, to move towards great. Um, this is a good report. And this is gonna be an important step to getting us to where we're going next in terms of, of getting this right. Um, and so I think this, this, this is, is imperative uh, that it go forward. I think there were a lot of comments that were, were, were really um, uh, honing in on, on some of the nuanced discussion that we were having here. So that makes me uh, uh, optimistic that there is a, a solution to be found. Um, because uh, there was not a single comment there that didn't want musicians and didn't want performers being able to make a living. It was about how we make this live so that residents uh, who live near uh, some of these venues um, uh, have the quality of life that they desire and that the, the, the working artists of, these, of this community and all communities uh, have the living that they need. Um, and so I think this is great work. And as Commissioner Mobley said, under incredibly challenging circumstances. So bravo to the staff. Okay. Any further discussion on the, on the motion? I do have one more comment. I'll, I will make it brief. Um, there were some other comments about 
being creative about places that are currently available for safe um, music venues such as the fairgrounds. This by no means prohibits any of that um, creative thinking. This is just um, a first step, phase one with guardrails for where we begin. All right, any other additional comments on the motion? If there are no further comments, um, I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner Lund? Yes. Yeah. Marshall? Yes. Hopefully. Yes. Commissioner Steig? Yes. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Commissioner uh, Weberg? Yes. Commissioner Whitry? Yes. All right, with that unanimous support for the motion to move forward to city council. Uh, thank you commissioners and we'll continue on to the next matter, zoning docket 00321, which we, we did the public comments. And I probably think we need the mute someone as well. There we go. <clears throat> All right. The First comment is from Vinny, Vincent Prevel, Prevel uh, 718 Pelican Avenue in opposition. For years, the city struggled with zoning issues <clears throat> and thus we adopted the master plan. Why should we go backwards and disregard the master plan? I would like to know what organization has requested the height reduction. Was it the Algiers Point Association or Riverview Association? Why would the city want to put another restriction on the riverfront, which has the most premier location and still has not sold? I own a single lot in that area and find it disturbing that the city would attempt to devalue my property and never even send me a communication in regards to it. Over 15 years ago, both Riverview and Algiers Point communities voted to approve high rise buildings along the riverfront. Why now do we want to go against what the community's already approved? Most importantly, why would the City Planning Commission consider violating the master plan which they helped create? Why? Next from Barry Kern, 919 Brooklyn Street in opposition. I'm writing as the largest property owner in Algiers Riverview on behalf of myself, my brother Blaine Kern Jr. and Holly Kern. <clears throat> We've been a staple in the Algiers community since 1932 when my dad located our family business there. That's nine decades, almost 100 years. We have been a source of jobs, of taxes, and economic development. Most importantly, we have been a source of pride for the community. Down the street from our property, there was an unpopular development project that sought a density bonus. Now it seems that because of this unpopular project, this proposed overlay is attacking the base zoning for all of us uh, all of the property in this area. The base zoning that the CZO assigned to the property is the, in this area is appropriate. Please don't create a conditional use of activities that support our cultural economy. Also, please don't take away our development rights for this riverfront property. I fear that this overreaction to a density bonus sought by another unpopular development will have a significant negative effect on our ability to conduct our business as well as any potential redevelopment of our site. <coughs> Next from Fitzkern, 919 Brooklyn Street in opposition. Our Kern family properties in this study area have been a source of jobs and economic development for culture bearers for nearly a hundred years. Whether it's artists making floats, movies being shot or celebratory events with local musicians, it is a place where cultural creators do their work. It has also been a place that almost became a mixed use development except for the crash of 2008 that prevented the project from moving forward. We are confident another high quality mixed use project will come about soon, allowing for further develop investment into the community. On behalf of the current properties, we urge that the underlying zoning district is appropriate for the site, reflect its historical uses and is compatible with the neighborhood and the master plan. We do not believe it makes sense to make conditional uses out of use categories that support the cultural economy. We think it is against sound principles of urban planning and to restrict the development rights for industrial and formal, former industrial sites along the river. The city did a great job in creating the underlying zoning just a few years ago, and we urge you to keep that underlying zoning intact. We believe that if there is to be a focus of this study, it should be on what qualifies for a density bonus or a height bonus. We don't believe it should be on the underlying zoning. Next from Michael Sherman, 
800 Barone Street, representing Kern Studios in opposition. I'm writing on behalf of the Kern properties. Mr. Barry Kern and Mr. Fitz Kern submitted comments today about how this proposed overlay hurts our cultural bearers and make conditional uses out of uses that support our cultural economy. I'd like to offer specific examples Cultural facilities would be make, made conditional uses. So would amusement facilities, both indoor and outdoor. Music studios and live performance venues, both principal and even secondary use would be conditional uses. And hospitality uses such as hotels and bars would be conditional as well. Over the years, the current properties have hosted countless cultural, cultural creators making floats and making music. They hosted tours and events for people wanting to be in this environment with culture creators. We think it is against the master plan and urban planning principles to restrict uses in the study area. Further, making the height just 40 feet and three stories takes away development rights that will prevent much needed high quality investment in our city and this neighborhood. While many cities across the country have enjoyed a renaissance of industrial properties along the river being transformed into high quality development, we would be enshrining in our zoning code a restriction that is a major hurdle to investment. It goes against the principles in our master plan that designate this area for the type of mixed use development that cannot be achieved in just 40 feet. I unfortunately believe if the height limit on these properties is put in place, we are locking down these properties in their current state for years. I encourage the city planning commission to support the CZO and master plan that allowed for a thoughtful base zoning district in this study area. I... Okay, I think that's the last comment. Is that okay. right, Stephen? Yes. All right, so at this time, uh, commissioners, do you have any comments um, or questions for staff um, on this zoning document? And if you don't, um, the chair will entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve staff recommendation. Is my, is my move my commissioner Weber to approve uh, staff recommendation? Is there a second to that motion? Commissioner Which second. Um, Commissioner, I'm sorry, was that Commissioner uh, Mobley? It was Mobley and Whitry, but I'll take it. <laughs> okay, and Commissioner um, Mobley has second um, the motion. Is there any further discussion on the motion for approval on the floor? Any further discussion on the motion? If there's no further discussion uh, on the motion. I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner Lund? Yes. Commissioner Marshall? Yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. Yes. Commissioner Steve? Can I give a proxy to uh, the young Marshall? <laughs> um, uh, vote yes. Commissioner Stewart votes yes in support. Uh, Commissioner Weaver? Yes. Commissioner Whitry? Yes, Commissioner Whitry. Okay. Unanimous support for the motion, uh, and the motion is carried for approval. Uh, we'll continue on to zoning docket 00821. Uh, we did not receive any public comment. Uh, Stephen, can you um, give us the recommendation by staff for zoning docket 00821? Yes, it's approval subject to four provisos. All right. Commissioners, are there any questions for staff or a motion uh, for zoning docket 00821? I'll move approval per staff's report. It's been moved by Commissioner Brown. Is there a second to that motion? Second by Commissioner Lund. It's been moved by Commissioner Brown for approval of staff recommend, rec recommendation. Second by Commissioner Lund. Is there any further discussion um, on the motion? Any further discussion on the motion? If not, I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Flick. Yes. Commissioner Lund. Yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. Commissioner Marshall? Yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. Commissioner Steve? Yes. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Weber? Yes. Commissioner Witcher? Yes. 
Unanimous support for approval. The motion um, is passed for zoning docket 00821. We'll continue on to zoning docket 00921. Uh, no comments and the request was, by staff was deferral to February 23rd. Okay. Was the recommendation by staff was for deferral. Are there any comments or questions for any commissioners or a motion? Motion to approve staff. Oh, Commissioner Fleck. <laughs> the motion uh, to defer per staff's recommendation for DACA 00921 till February 23rd. I think that's a fabulous motion and I'm happy to second. It's been moved by Commissioner Fleck for a deferral and seconded by Commissioner Weaver. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Then if there's no further discussion on the motion, I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown. Yes. Commissioner Flick. Yes. Commissioner Lund. Yes. Commissioner Marshall. Yes. Commissioner Mobley. Yes. Commissioner Steve. Yes. Stewart. Yes. Commissioner Weberg. Yes. Commissioner Witcher. Yes. Unanimous in support. Um, the motion is passed for deferral. We will continue on um, to subdivision docket one three three twenty, and we did not receive any public comment. Stephen. Uh, the recommendation is tentative approval with final approval subject to three provisos. All right. At this time now, uh, Commissioner, do you have any questions for staff or a motion uh, for subdivision document 13320? Commissioner Flick will make a motion for tentative approval for subdivision docket 133320 uh, subject to three provisos. That is a move by Commissioner Flick for approval for, um, for subdivision docket one. 3320. Is there um, a second to that motion? Second, Commissioner Lund. It's been seconded by Commissioner Lund. Is there any further discussion uh, on the motion that's on the floor? Any further discussion on the motion? If there's no further discussion on the motion, I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner Lund? Yes. Commissioner Marshall? Yes. yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. Commissioner Steve? Yes. Commissioner Stewart, yes. Commissioner Weaver? Yes. Commissioner Whitry? Yes. All right. Unanimous support for the motion. The motion is carried um, for approval and we'll continue moving on to subdiv subdivision docket 13620. Uh, we did not receive any public comment. Um, uh, staff recommendation is tentative approval subject to one waiver and four provisos. So are, are there any comments or questions for staff or a motion uh, for this uh, document? Motion to approve staff recommendation. Mm -hmm. Is there a second to that motion? Commissioner Flick will second. Then moved by Commissioner Weaver for um, approval for subdivi subdivision document 13620, seconded by Commissioner Flick. Is there any further discussion on the motion on the floor? Any further discussion? If not, I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner Lund? Yes. Commissioner Marshall? Yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. Commissioner Steve? Yes. Commissioner Stewart votes yes. Commissioner Weber? Yes. Commissioner Witcher? Commissioner Witcher? Yes. Okay. All right. The motion is carried for um, approval, and we will continue on to our next and the final docket matter, subdivision docket 13720. Uh, no public comment, and the staff recommendation is tentative approval subject to three provisos. Commissioners, do you have any comments or questions for staff or a motion uh, for the last subdivision docket? Okay, uh, Commissioner Lyon, I move for accept, uh, acceptance of staff's recommendation for tentative approval for the subdivision docket 13720, subject to three provisos. Is there a second to that motion? Around seconds. It's been moved by Commissioner Lyon for tentative approval for subdivision docket 13720, um, seconded by Com Commissioner Brown. Is there any further discussion on the motion? If there's no further discussion on the motion, I'll call the question. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Flick? Yes. Commissioner Lund? Yes. Commissioner Marshall? Yes. Commissioner Mobley? Yes. 
Commissioner Steig? Yes. Commissioner Stewart, yes. Com uh, Commissioner Weberg? Yes. Commissioner Whitry? Yes. Unanimous support for approval for sub for tentative approval for subdivision docket 137 uh, 20. And that brings us to the end of our um, meeting for today. Um, any further comments um, by any commissioner before we close or our executive director? Okay. Um, if not, the chair will entertain a motion for adjournment at 3.52 p.m. So moved. Which we, yeah, so moved. All right, it's been moved by Commissioner Lawrence. There a second? Which we second. And Commissioner Which we have second the motion. Um, if everyone is in favor, you can raise your hand. As long as there's uh -huh. no opposition, we're going to do a roll call vote. Is there any opposition? Um, everyone's in favor. So at this time, thank you, commissioners, for joining us. The motion is carried, and we are now adjourned. Thank you, Commissioner Stanton. Bye, everybody. Stay well. Bye, Stay well.